flows and it, it, it's a network. By 2050, six billion people will live in cities. It is of great urgency that we understand cities in a profound and predictive fashion. Technology is now becoming natural, atomized, distributed, and is radically changing the way we interface with the city. The technology is there. The challenges are, are so overwhelming that there, there is no option anymore not to act. We will not succeed if we do not succeed in cities. We cannot create a better world without better cities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank God, I thought that magnificent duck shepherd's pie that they served at lunch. I don't, if, you did, if you didn't enjoy the duck shepherd's pie, the duck with mashed potatoes, you lost out. But I'm sure there were those who had more than, yeah, yes, you see the, the panel agrees. Well, good afternoon, and um, we now come to a very, an extremely interesting discussion on cities, the urbanization, and we have an extraordinary array of talent uh, joining us um, to, to, to put it into perspective. But here's the interesting thing, and I'm going to ask you to bear this in mind when you first of all speak for five minutes each. This could be quite difficult for some of them. So I have warned them that if they go on for longer than five minutes, on the sixth minute, I start to shuffle in my chair. The seventh minute, I cough diplomatically. If they're still going at the tenth minute, there'll be trouble. But anyway, um, we are not here to debate whether urbanization is happening, whether it's a good thing, whether cities are good or bad, because I think the moment we go down that road, we should have all stayed at home. We are here to discuss, debate, and you are here to question the panel, uh, as well as myself, on the very real question of where we are going, what is best practice, what works, what doesn't, what mistakes you have seen, and what your hopes are for the future. And I want to start off by asking our first guest to, to, to address us. Uh, the president and chief executive of Ericsson is Hans Vestberg, and he is a man who is very familiar with the issues of how we bring information, technology, to the people in cities. Hans, would you like to start? Are you from there or from wherever you like? Uh, I sit here, and I guess I have no option, so I start. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, as you said, uh, urbanization is happening, so we're not here to debate that. I think infrastructure has always been a very important part for cities. And uh, even when we started to build cities for hundreds of years ago, infrastructure was there. We started by building roads, uh, all other type of facilities needed. Today, when we build cities and when cities are growing, ICT becomes a very, very important part of cities. And I think that we are now seeing all around the world when it comes to cities that ICT is a vital part of the infrastructure today that has to be there. And um, if you think about today in the world of it, mobility and telecommunication, I will just give you a couple of statistics to understand how transformative the technology is. Today, it's more than six, six billion mobile subscriptions in the world. Um, some 4.2 billion unique mobile uh, phone users. 85% uh, of the Earth population has mobile coverage. The interesting is it will not stop there. By 2016, we estimate it's going to be 5 billion mobile broadband users. And uh, that means that we're going to triplicate the amount of people that have access to internet compared to today. And the main part of all those users, they will start with mobility. And they will not, as uh, some of us, start with a black and white TV, PC, computer, color TV, feature phone, and a smartphone. They will start with a wireless connectivity and going backwards. 
and they will start to innovate. So that's very important in all this. And where is cities coming in all in that discussion? The majority of all data consumption will be in big cities. We estimate it's going to be 60, over 60% 60 of all data traffic is going to be in the major cities in the world. And from today and some five years out, it's going to be 10 times uh, more data traffic in the networks. So of course, cities are going to carry a lot of that. And just one fact maybe on Ericsson. Ericsson is then having roughly 40% or 38% of all mobile infrastructure in the world. And 50% uh, of all smartphone traffic in the world is going through Ericsson equipment. So we are well, well sort of defined in the major cities. When we talk about the cities and how important they are, of course, another area is what is the social and economic impact of, of, uh, of ICT? And here we have done a lot of surveys pulling together all the studies that has been done on broadband and two stats that you just need to carry on when we go into the, the conversation. For every 10% of mobile or broadband penetration, it's 1% sustainable GDP. And for every 1,000 broadband connections, you create 80 net jobs. Of course, it, it's not only the broadband pipe that is important, it's what you're doing on top of it. And I think that's where uh, we started to look into the Network Society Index. We measured the biggest cities in the world in uh, how they used and what type of readiness they had on ICT. Everything from mobility to broadband in the cities. And uh, we did it last year, and the city that has the best readiness and, and used it most was Singapore. Paris was number five. But there's a growing importance to have that infrastructure. And I think the main reason that that is important is in the future, the mobile network and the broadband will not only cater that we have a social network in the cities and can talk and we have a work life, it will also support the traffic management, connected cars, not only that, the smart grids and the usage of energy will be steered by the mobility in order to use it in the best way. I think all of that we are now seeing happening in cities in order to handle the load of people coming to the cities and actually using networks. We call that the network society. Basically, anything that benefits from being connected will be connected in the future. And the cities will be a very important and vital part for that. And that's why discussions like this become so important. We have multi-stakeholders from industry, from governments, and from uh, politicians and rule makers, because together we can make this happen. But what we naturally uh, don't think about is I mean, you think of the smartphone, or you think of the iPad, or you think of the pipe and the broadband, but you don't necessarily think about the infrastructural problems to get that and to maintain that. Absolutely, you're right. I mean, we built all the networks in these cities together with operators, and of course, they initially require a lot of space. Uh, so we need to invent new technologies to handle all this traffic, which we're doing with smaller cells in another way. Minister, um, the... Greg Clark is the UK Minister for Decentralization and Cities. What a wonderful word. Um, Minister, I suspect of all our panel, you maybe have the most difficult task because <laughs> you have to carry your board. <laughs> he has to carry Parliament yeah, okay. and the electorate Got it. Got it. and the opposite and and beat the opposition at the same time minister how is the uk faring well uh, i might say richard i think that is the least of it uh, carrying the electorate um the very title minister for decentralization yes. <laughs> tells you something that if you want to as i do and the, the the government in the uk does want to transfer power from central government to cities and local government in general uh, it it doesn't just happen it requires a real uh, sense of it requires a real purpose. You need to create a minister to almost literally prize people's fingers off the off the levers of power and give them somewhere else. So that is my purpose, and it's um, uh, and it's a reflection on where I think the UK in particular uh, has come to uh, in recent years, which is in some ways. I mean, you, you, Richard, you talk about uh, the urbanisation and the growth of cities being inevitable. One of the, the great advantages for the UK, it seems to me, uh, is that in terms of the industrial city, we were there first. 
as being the first nation to industrialize, we were the first to, to wrestle with some of these challenges as how you can accommodate people living very closely together, how you can provide services like sewerage facilities, how you can provide urban uh, transportation, uh, how you can develop policies such as land use planning that uh, stop the environment being degraded. So uh, we have many advantages. Uh, but what has happened, I think, over the last 100 years uh, in the UK is that the growth of central government uh, in London has taken more and more power away from local government and away from cities in particular. So that some of our great industrial cities, uh, who, which have had a worldwide reputation uh, in the past, have, in more recent decades, I think become more subordinate to central London than is desirable. So, so my purpose is to try to do something uh, about that. And I think there are a number of ways in which you can, uh, you can tackle it. Uh, the first is to, uh, is to look at the laws. Uh, amazingly, the, the way that local government has been uh, constructed in statutory terms uh, in the UK is that local government, local councils, have existed to do those things that central government tell it to do, and no more. Anything else has been ultra vires. So they exist literally as, de as delivery mechanisms for central government. We've introduced the, the new government in Britain, has introduced an act of parliament called the Localism Act that turns that completely upside down. It's now the case that any municipal authority uh, in Britain has the right to do anything that it wants unless it's specifically prevented by parliament. So change the, the default. Uh, the other aspect uh, is to, uh, to encourage the, the development of uh, of leaders in cities and to devolve greater powers uh, to those cities. We have, I think, in the audience the, the, the new mayor of Liverpool who was elected for the first time, the first time a mayor of Liverpool, a great city, has been elected, Joe Anderson, who is sitting there uh, in the middle of the, the conference. And actually, it's a significant moment, I think, that the, the mayor of Liverpool uh, is here because Liverpool, in some ways, is an example of, I think, uh, a process that went wrong in central government. In the 1980s, uh, Liverpool got into a very antagonistic relationship with central government, uh, and the result of which was powers were taken away from the city and vested in central government. Uh, Joe Anderson, the new mayor, and I uh, are working together so that we can transfer powers back to the city, um, and I think for him to, to be here with a, uh, a minister in the government shows how things have changed. And, and what would you do... Uh, M M Mr. Mayor from Liverpool, uh, I'm more, I was born in your city, so I and lived many years. My family's from Liverpool, so I'll take a few. I'll have a word with you later. Um, <laughs> and if I really think about it, I can put on the Scouse accent again. Um, Minister, the, if the mayor suddenly became unfriendly, if you were back to a Ken Livingstone in GLC or a Derek Hatton in Liverpool, would you be taking those powers back again, ASAP? <laughs> no, I think it is for, it's the classic question, and I think we resolved it incorrectly what, you wouldn't give during the, the 80s and, and 90s, and I think it is for the people of Liverpool to decide uh, who leads them. If you look in, in London, the experience in London of having created a mayoralty uh, over the last 12 years, uh, those of you there will know there have been two very different types of mayors. A Labour mayor, Ken Livingstone, and a Conservative mayor, Boris Johnson. Very different approaches. The one thing that I think unites almost every Londoner is that having someone right. who is able to stand up to central government has been very much in the interest of London. We'll come to that in a moment. Daniel Liebeskind is with us, the architect from Studio Daniel Liebeskind. Um, <clears throat> one of the world's truly great city thinkers and architects, and we're very honored you. that you are here, sir, um, particularly for the superb work that you have done in Lower Manhattan Thank you. around Ground Zero, which I think we all pay homage and respect to you for the design and, and the way you you've, you've done it. But come on, Daniel. I mean, you walked over fire getting that project through and many of the projects, and doesn't that show you the difficulties of doing major infrastructure projects in our big major cities. It's a great, great comment because, of course, uh, working in a democratic atmosphere, you have to understand that you have different stakeholders. Not everybody agreed in New York in the beginning what to do. 
There are many uh, ideas. Some people wanted only low buildings after the attacks at Ground Zero. The, the, the then mayor of New York. Some people wanted to rebuild exactly two buildings. Some people wanted to build one mega building. Uh, and what I consider important about that competition was that the public got involved, and there were a lot of different opinions. At the same time, I followed my own intuitions as an immigrant to New York to create a project that spoke to New Yorkers. It, it, it had to tell a story about what happened that day. And that meant not using half the site for buildings. Half the site out of the 16-acre site is public space. Does it also mean in a place like New York and London and any of the major cities that basically you have to have a fairly democratic dictator? Well, you have to have a very thick skin if you're going to be a planner, an architect, someone who will deliver a project to the people. Because at the end, it's not about the politicians, not about the investors only, not about even the architects working on a large project, not even about the families. It's about everybody who will be, who is a citizen of New York. And therefore, you have to steer the project and garner a consensus, bring people together. And of course, that means you also will have to do compromises, which are necessary to move a project forward. You can't have a, you can have a nice picture in a museum or in an archive, but if you want to deliver a project, you have to navigate in the complexity of politics, economics, right. and uh, the everyday life uh, of a great city. We'll come to that in a minute. Ricky um, Burdett, the director of the LSE Cities and Urban Age. Of the three, commerce, government, design, who has the hardest job these days? Uh, the people not represented in these groups. <laughs> Which are? Well, the people who live in these cities. But I mean, these in, people... In reality, the people who have the hardest time are the people who are... Uh, behind the statistics that you were alluding to, who are not governed by inspired leaders or who can't commission great designers or who can't benefit from the infrastructure. And these are something in cities of India, say, or African cities, something like 60 or 70 percent of these burgeoning cities. So, I mean, I think that is uh, an important issue. And I'm not being cynical about no. who's here. I think it's part of the debate which brings the New City Summit and other organizations like our own to together. I mean, in a way, we've been there before, haven't we? I mean, you're talking about the infrastructure of the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, in the 19th century, Paris, Berlin, London, of course, New York, uh, invested in other forms of infrastructure, which was uh, the cable car or lighting and everything else. And we saw cities become transformed really dramatically, some cases for the better, some cases for the worse. And I think that these are issues which really uh, are, are intriguing for people like us to sort of understand. I mean, just two statistics, Richard. I mean, one is 33% of all new urban dwellers today, right, happening today, 33% are living in slums without sanitation, without basic infrastructure of any sort, let alone a mobile phone. I mean, right, that's not Liverpool's problem or, or London's problem. 75% um, of CO2 emissions in the world come from cities, not necessarily for bad reasons, because cities are the engines of the world economy, as we know from Saskia Sassen, who's speaking here tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. But how we take these cities you know, from, from the hair, so to speak, and rearrange them so that the infrastructure is both kind to the citizens, but also kind <coughs> to the environment, is I think the thing which uh, there's so much to learn from. And politics is part of it, but sometimes in India, you don't even have an elected mayor in most of the Indian cities that we're talking about, with the exception of New Delhi. All right, so in, now we can have a free-for-all. In that scenario, let's, let, let's stick with you, uh, Ricky. In that scenario, <clears throat> how far is the problem practical these days in designing cities and designing the metropoli our metro metropolises, and how much is this philosoph philosophical? We don't know what we want them to be. Well, we'll start with Ricky and then we'll Well, I, I think uh, there are two very important parallel and overlapping worlds, and I think probably this is where Danny and I would certainly agree. Unless you get the physical right, and by physical I do mean the, also the, the, the non-physical <laughs> in the sense of the infrastructure. Unless you don't get that right, you actually can create environments, cities which exclude people from engagement, I think. Then there's the cultural, you call it the philosophical, but it's very much the political, that you have to believe in the institutions that make engagement possible. The two are connected. That's why there are the four of us on this table. Well, I, I think, you know, we used to have an idea in the 20th century that cities could be built as experimental city experiments, mm -hmm. kind of tabula rasa. There's no history. There's no context. You build whatever you want, whatever the imagination tells you. But I think people have learned that 
history is much more complex. There is history. Sometimes it's not visible. But you have to connect to that history in order to create really a place, a city that really can move forward. And without that connection, as Ricky said, to what was there, that doesn't mean copying. That doesn't mean the nostalgia for the past. But without the cultural aspect of development, cities fail. Pardon. I totally agree. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, there are cities in different shapes that has built infrastructure and that need to modernize, and some others which, of course, are in the making right now. And, and the big challenge for those that are in the making is, of course, to get it right right now because there will be tough because many of the city dwellers, they have no option. They will move to that city. And I think it's important, and I see it when I meet cities all around the world. The, the big cities understand it's a competitive environment. For an enterprise like Ericsson or whatever, if you want to move to a big city, you think, what type of infrastructure is there? How can you get hold of, of the right things? So of course, that is creating also competition between cities nowadays to do a very robust and sustainable city. Zero sum competition. One city wins, one city loses. Yes. Would you agree? Nah, not if all they're what? competing, what? they're all improving, <laughs> hopefully. That's the whole idea, because they see what you can create by using. They're all improving. Yep, that's the whole idea. That's are, why we're here. Are they? I think they can. I think. Uh, well, are they? <laughs> they're not, clearly. Right. Um, so uh, you're not doing a very good job. Well, uh, the, not the, you personally. <laughs> the, uh, that's why policymakers, I think, need to take an interest in it and find ways in which cities can live up to their potential. But the, I think one of the key aspects uh, is that when we talk about cities, cities are not identical. We, you know, even in the, uh, the title of the, uh, the program, we can be forgiven into thinking that there is something generic uh, called a city for which there are standard solutions. One of the things in my uh, brief tenure in, in my post in the government is even within the UK, to recognize that the character, the history, the, uh, the skills, the attributes of cities, even 35 miles apart, are hugely different. And one of the reasons why I think more decisions need to be taken locally is that it's only locally that you can bring out the, the heartbeat of that city rather than impose on it some rather more clinical solution. But isn't that the problem? That the fact cities are not the same can be used as a reason for and used as a reason against. You can turn it to the advantage of why it's so difficult and something's not done or why something should be done. Well, cities uh, certainly used to be nations competing against each other. Now cities mm -hmm. are in competition globally. And that means that uh, people have rediscovered. It's a renaissance of the discovery that why do people come to cities in the first place? Because they can meet other people. They, there is they a come for jobs. They can get a job. They come for jobs. They can job, but jobs means meeting other people. Jobs means getting a better job. Jobs mean getting a better place to live. So it's about health, it's about life, it's about everything that we associate with civility. But cities that don't compete lose populations. Look at Detroit. Detroit, I used to live in Detroit. It was a, you know, a, a big city and now it has shrunk to almost a village size. And that's a city that hadn't had that political impetus to, to update itself, to renew itself, to grow. Detroit failed, or failing, because of a failure of industrial policy. No, that's, that's part of it. Yeah, but it need not go that way. I mean, I mean, I think this is where policy and leadership and investment from, uh, or belief certainly in a city on the part of a corporate mm. becomes very important because take Turin, take yeah. Munich, uh, take Barcelona. Industrial cities. Uh, all of them had big automotive industries or related, which collapsed in the 80s, more or less. Fiat in Italy, uh, Italian car manufacturer lost 100,000 jobs. Mm. They picked themselves up by working with the universities, very important, by working with uh, reskilling re uh, sort of people who used to make cars and they made parts of airplanes instead. So that's the issue about Detroit and the American city perhaps, uh, which is lacking. And there's a sort of political void and a loss of confidence. But let's be careful not to get too comfortable. The big problem of cities is not in these cities. The big problem sure. of the city is what's gonna happen in Lagos, well, that's, what's gonna happen in it. Bangkok. And on that point, Han, because you can make your generous investments in broadband and all these other in, in nice, comfortable, developed OECD cities <laughs> at one level. Yeah. But as a company, your growth ultimately is going to be in these other emerging markets, isn't it? 
No, I think it's a balance of it. But of course, those cities are extremely important for growth. But I, I, I see also modernization happening in capitals in Europe and uh, as I would see in, in other big cities. So I think it, it, it's a balance of it. But of course, there's a different way. You come from a different level of modernization. You have an infrastructure and modernization or you're building the network. But in, a, in an era of limited resources for a chief executive, where are you going to put those resources? Now you're asking probably the wrong com company because we are in 180 countries. So we well, are you, you direct your investment, though. No, I would say that infrastructure, the good thing with, by, with the ICT is that we use the same standard technology regardless of where we are in the world. That's why everyone here, wherever you come from, the mobile phone works in Paris. So we sell the same technology all over, bring down the cost, and we can get it achievable. And you can buy a GSM phone for $20, $30 for that reason, because all are saying the use scale of 2G, 3G, and 4G. And that is, of course, what is driving it to a mass market. But, but let's not get too pessimistic uh, about poor oh. cities, cities that haven't had uh, that. Was it pessimistic? No. <laughs> no, uh, I no. I think he was, was talking about me. me. <laughs> okay, was talking about no, That's why he was attacking me politely. You know, <laughs> we are building a large scale, maybe one of the largest master plants and, and city centers in the historical center of Seoul, Korea. Korea was a poor Fantastic. country 60 years ago. Korea was not uh, uh, no, at the Fantastic. forefront. Fantastic. And yet, the country itself, the policy, economic, mm. political, architectural, planning policies, have led to a true improvement of living conditions and of yes. life in the so city. So what's your biggest problem in putting together this master plan? Uh, the biggest problem is getting authorities, investors, well, and everyone to move in the same directions. Well, because, hang on, that's pretty fundamental. Okay, it is fundamental. Because <laughs> that's going to be your failure. No, because at the end, when you're drawing well, something, when you're making a city, you're not making a virtual world. You're making a physical, stable world, and that has to... That's a work of art that's going to last for hundreds of years. So that cannot be done just by a committee of opinions. It has to be done in a way that will be sustainable in the long run. If you wait for consensus, you will get nowhere. Oh, no. That's not true. No, that's not true. No, no. no. We don't agree. <laughs> will you take that? Will you take that? I, I, I think you need no. to take some very tough decisions which go beyond yeah. the not-in-my-backyard scenario. And consensus sometimes uh, leads to sort of a lowest con common denominator. That is true. Or nothing. The, the, or nothing. I mean, the Seoul uh, project is extraordinary because it actually created uh, 100,000 jobs, I think, exactly. actually there too, exactly. in the space of a decade uh, because corporates mm. and politicians sort of got together. So it was a slightly different uh, sort of scenario. But I think one of the very interesting things about the technology investment in infrastructure is that if you take the poorer countries, and I am extremely positive about this, and by poorer, I mean, it's all relative in life, but I mean, say Brazil or other South American Absolutely. cities, we'll talk about this in a session later, I think. It's where you overlay the infrastructure, let's call it that the, the, these networks provide with political and civic engagement, where you're actually getting extraordinary in innovation, also in, uh, in, in democratic engagement. And, 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 and in that sense, it's without necessarily changing, Greg, the, the political system or giving power to mayors. I mean, one can say that a few days ago, unfortunately, mm -hmm. your plan, which I sort of endorse, didn't get the thumbs up, except for Liverpool and Bristol. And it's London, on its own. <laughs> uh, because most of the cities that were asked to vote in the UK, most, there weren't that many, voted against it. So. Uh, having a mayor, which is, you know, what, sure. what since, do you then do? Since your policy has been, I won't say shot in the foot, um, let's just say it's now got a few stones in its shoe, <laughs> um, how do you now move forward? Because you want your localism, if there is such a word. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you want that as a policy, and I assume you're still you're moving forward with that. But it's very difficult now you've lost your mayors. No, well, I, I, they haven't been lost, and I think one of the... Uh, the key things that I think unites us all is I think leadership counts. It, it, things don't happen sometimes without leadership. And I think that just as uh, nations can be well-led, corporations can be well-led, cities can be well-led. And I think that policymakers uh, nationally should try to maximize the opportunities for leadership. But let me say what's happened in the, in the UK. At the beginning of last year in the United Kingdom, the only big city led by a mayor was London. By the end of this year, uh, London will have a mayor, Liverpool has its mayor, Leicester has a mayor, Bristol will have a mayor. Uh, and I think that the, the demonstrated success uh, of these cities uh, over the, the years to come will show that uh, the, the, the returns to leadership will make a difference. And I think the, the mold has been broken. And I think sometimes you know, it, it's not so much revolution uh, as demonstration uh, which brings people uh, to it that, that will be uh, characterized Britain. 
just a quick comment there. I, mean, I think that what we see is, of course, we're coming into the second phase of the 21st uh, uh, sec century's uh, technology. And the first phase was basically to build these networks to actually make calls in between us. So the only service was voice. Of course, when we look into that, and that's telling a lot of the story that you are telling, is that it's obvious that you can do digital education. You can be able to do di digital healthcare in the future. And that's, of course, with an ICT environment, will totally change the post potential to address some of the challenges, not solve them all. ICT is not the solution to everything, but it's a great part of it. Equally, CO2 emission, if you use ICT in a smart way, mm -hmm. you can address 15 or 20 percent of the ICT just by doing traffic management mm -hmm. and all this. And that's, of course, in a city that's now developed, you have a great chance to do. But if ICT is used to its maximum effect, we don't need to grow the cities. Now, I will not uh, counter how, how much people will go to the cities or not, but they will have an impact on it, a positive impact, to see that we can get more people to cities, and actually they will have a sustainable and green life in a city. And I think that's where the competition is, and that's where we, different stakeholders, has been so easy before. We build a network, Ericsson, we create R&D, the products, we sell it to an operator, and then bring it out. Now we need to talk to all of these, to see that we all do it for different industries and bring it out. But technology, as, as important as it is, we couldn't live without it. It's our oxygen, uh, uh, the information technology, education, so on, all, everything depends on it. But let's not forget that to create a great city, you need to take a risk. Take a look at Paris. In the 19th century, Paris could not compete. It was a dense network of alleyways, dirt, and housemen, of course, a kind of dictator, cut through, created a modern city in a kind of minute. And of course, we don't have that kind of uh, longing for, uh, for authority, but we have the longing as architects, planners, investors, uh, uh, politicians, to create a city that is not just mediocre improvement, but really lifts the city to another quantum leap. Uh, to, to quote another houseman, Ricardo Houseman of, uh, of Harvard, uh, the stakes are high for, for cities. What, what he says is that the uh, nation's uh, their, their differences in wealth and income are closely related to their ability to manage complexity. Now that comes to the heart, it seems to me, of cities and the management of cities. Uh, cities, their raison d'etre is to manage complexity, is to bring people together so they can have complex interactions with many different people. If they succeed in doing that and facilitating that, making them attractive places, then that can unleash precisely the effects that Hausman says. If, however, the, uh, the complexity is poorly contained, uh, and it becomes dystopian, then clearly the opposite uh, happens. So this is why leadership counts. It's why the stakes are really high for cities. But, you know, I, I wish we were now, in the 21st century, doing more of, of this. And uh, I mean, I think actually one of the biggest challenges, one doesn't want to be unkind or rude to one's hosts in La Défense. But, I mean, <laughs> it Boy, takes I'll... some ability to design an environment with so little soul. Right? I mean, it's really, I, I've forgotten what it was like, right? It's quite, it's quite But it serves its, but hang on. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend La Defense. Go ahead. Bearing in, <laughs> we'll leave and go and have a coffee somewhere. But, in but mind. no, but the, sorry, the point I'm making is really picking up on Danny's very, very significant thing, yeah. and we shouldn't lose this, because, which is creating an infrastructure is just that. It's nothing more. You can, you, you can make what you want of it. You can shoot mm. cannon down it. You, you can, uh, or you can make it a, a place full of uh, intensity in life. I think that's what you were getting at. What we are doing around the world, and I'd have to say more or less everywhere, unfortunately, it's not just east, west, north, and south, is creating more and more anodyne environments. Yeah. Single function, dormitory towns, gated communities for the rich or for the poor. I mean, a very, very different sort of environment. That's why I, I, I know it's un, un, unkind and a, and a silly jab to use La Défense, but there's a lot of that happening around the world, rather than having the confidence, which is what you're talking right. about, of laying out this infrastructure, Who do you which blame? becomes complex. Who do you blame? And don't say that it's not a blame issue. <laughs> no, and I, I think uh, because, land, you know, no, uh, land ownership, big deal. Right. Who owns the land and what do you want to do with it? And to a degree, politicians, including not in your case. Uh, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think English cities don't particularly suffer from that. They suffer from other problems. Right. But I, I think uh, politicians not thinking 50 years ahead, but just in terms of their election cycle, 
makes a big difference. And, and Rick is right. I think it's, it's when we get lost and forget that cities are about people. They are not about abstract buildings. They are not about facades. They are not about sun collectors. They are about, not about the picture postcard view of high-rise buildings. They are about what does it feel like walking, no. having a cup of coffee, meeting a friend, going right. to school, having a family. And I think that ground level is literally the ground yeah. from which we have to think about cities. How did we get it so wrong? Well, I think it's utopian mechanistic ideas of reducing the complexity mm -hmm. of the city. I agree mm -hmm. with the minister. Redu the reductive thinking that reduces city to a kind of machine is not enough because it's a human institution. Can we reverse that? It's being reversed, I think. We know examples. Many, we know many examples uh, of great cities that have renewed themselves. Look at New York. New York was, had highways around the city uh, put by an authoritarian you know, master planner, uh, <laughs> Robert Moses. And now we are recovering the waterfront. People are moving. Mm -hmm. There's housing. There, there, there are other... And it's, I'm but working. the fascinating part about the New York experience is that it was another authoritarian <laughs> regime Maybe New York is so generous. It, you know, it requires a, an authoritarian no, regime to get something. No, I think every good city, as, as the minister said, has to have a good leadership. Absolutely. And, and yeah. that good leadership means involving people in the decision-making process. And that's been true in Britain as well. If you look at the at London, London has prospered in recent years. Uh, there was a congestion charge introduced that you will be uh, familiar with, uh, Richard, and it was very controversial uh, at the time. The, uh, the, the first mayor of London, not a member of my party, uh, introduced it using some political capital. Uh, it hasn't been reversed, uh, we'll notice. If you look at the, the northern cities, Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester, a lot of their success has actually been uh, to, to do, as, as Daniel would advocate, to kind of rediscover the fabric, the, the organic fabric of the city, rather than to anonymize them. Just want to confirm, we just released today a consumer lab research for 14 big cities. I mean, first of all, people move to the cities for jobs, as we say. But what they're looking for is, of course, green areas, as we talk about, a nice, uh, culture and arts that uh, there is in that. And finally, what is really the biggest bottleneck and hurdle is the traffic. I mean, in average, in these 14 cities, they are spending two hours and 20 minutes a, uh, a day in traffic, in average, on these 14 top cities, right. which you all know. And of course, that's a huge time in that. Then you need to think, can you reduce the traffic? Can you be more efficient in the traffic? This is type of things we need to think about how we can address. Because Where the are these 14? Yeah, that, that was type uh, Sweden, Moscow, Paris, yeah. and all of these. It was big cities. We made, made a consumer study on that. And I think it's clear to me that we need to address the traffic management because infrastructure, you cannot build more roads. But, but create, creating great oh. sustainable cities, creating public transport. Oh. Yes. Yeah, Without yeah, public transport, we, you, you have to... No, just one thing, you know, the link between these, the, the, these words, you know, public infrastructure, transport, which, you know, sound very generic, but if you think, you know, taking mm. your statistic, in, in, in Sao Paulo, Bangkok, average commuting times, Mexico City are four, four and a half yes, hours. Yes, that's so much higher. Imagine that you are a policeman or a nurse, mm. right? and you're spending two, two and a half hours on a crowded bus, or in a car, if you can afford it. What are you like as a father or as a, someone who has to do that job? You know, do right. you, so the, the impacts on the soul are absolutely immediate. I'm going to pause and invite you Don't to join in at this particular point. Raise your hand if you have a thought uh, that you, you, you'd like to. If not, uh, uh, maybe the mayor from, Mr. Mayor from Liverpool. <laughs> Since you have been, um, but we have microphones. Can, Although I'm sure, since he's from Liverpool, we'll hear him without. <laughs> it's been my experience, anyway. Um, Mr. Mayor, what is going to be, now you're the all-powerful all supremo mayor from the Mersey, um, what's going to be your number one power that you want him to give you back? It's a negotiation, open negotiation. The first, the first thing we'll do is invite you, Richard, to come and see the city because it's changed since you were last there. Well, the only thing I remember about Liverpool, just to pause for one second, <laughs> is during the, during the 80s and 90s, the only thing, the entire regeneration was based around the Albert Dock. Mm -hmm. And every time you ever spoke to anyone from Liverpool, all they ever say is, yes, but we've got the Albert Dock. So what's your first number one policy you want from him? Well, we've got so much more than that now. So, right. as I said, it's about time you visit. Right. But what, what, what we need is, I mean, when, when we're talking about new cities, we, we, we're talking about regeneration of cities. What we've, we, we fundamentally forget every time we talk about regeneration of cities and the infrastructure of cities, 
we forget the fundamental part, and that's the regeneration of people as well who live in those cities, because often they're disaffected and left to one side. But what I want from, from central government is, is the ability to do things for ourselves. Now, as much as I like Greg, I think he's, he, he, he's a good man, and, and his heart's in the right place, okay. I know what's the best for my city right. and right. how we but, can make uh, look, it work better. And so what I want from him is devolvement of powers uh, and resources to make things work better. He's going to give you that. He's already said he's going to give you that. And, and if we can show competence and confidence in the way we do things, I'm confident we'll get so much more. Because it's about time that powers work devolved right. and that's the, that's the whole concept of the decentralization agenda from this government fine I, I, I hear what you say Mayor. Um, he's already said he's gonna give you that that's the whole point give me a concrete power you want back well a, a, con a concrete power could be in terms of connectivity which is about transport we, we need much more ability to connect uh, the conurbation with the city centre, so we can continue to right. connect all of the all of the areas around the city of Liverpool. So better transport system and, and a better ability to develop that. Are you going to give him it? It's fantastic. It's such a transparency of government. We conduct these negotiations. Uh, on the, well, let's face it. On the public stage. Uh, uh, and, I, I'm, and I'm recording uh, this, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Joe. I think it is right. ridiculous that the, the transport decisions affecting Liverpool, the city of Liverpool, are taken at the moment. Uh, in a minister's desk right. in London. He should have them. You got it. You owe me. You owe me. <laughs> we got there in the end. Let's have another question or another point from... Yes, ma'am. Who are you and why should we listen? Hi, Richard. You can't see me. This is Robin Chase. Ah! What I, I loved the comment that the, top, the major problem in the top 14 cities was two hours and 30 minutes in traffic. And your further comment about how to resolve this. I think when we look at cities and the densification of cities, it's clear we can't have people moving across cities in these right. volumes in single occupancy vehicles, period. There just isn't enough road space. So the number of things that we can do to diminish people driving by themselves and big cars is a key. When I think of the Liverpool um, mayor's challenge, there is this regionalization that has to happen. That who is doing that traveling, who owns the rights of ways, the parking, mm -hmm. and the cities around, right. how do they get together? The problem is you've got to take some pretty unpleasant decisions or firm decisions to implement that, don't you? Well, uh, let me just uh, give a point of optimism on, uh, on that. So leaving aside the, the current patterns of traffic use, actually IT has a lot to offer. If you, oh, for example, your way. Uh, uh, your way. Uh, uh, a, a lot of journeys around the city uh, are people looking for a parking space. Uh, if you can have uh, technology that tells you exactly where there's a parking space, actually a lot of the congestion within city centres can go. In terms of public transport, more people would use Who's going to pay for all that infrastructure investment? I saw, I tried the Autolib in Paris here this morning, which is phenomenal, I have to say, uh, in the way. And there it was on the computer screen in my car, telling me where the car parkings were, which were available, which were not. Who's going to pay for it? Government, private sector? A combination. I think it should be in proportion to the benefits of the nation and the benefits of the city. But it's not just who's going to pay for what, because that sounds very negative. I think, again, what, what Danny was getting at is that land use planning, boring term, but just getting, fixing the city and deciding where things go, and maybe deregulating to the point that just letting things happen, allow city centers to become much more mixed. That means people don't need to move that much. So it, it's not just that you have to throw lots of money at these things. Yeah, but but it's actually, out. Ricky is, uh, is pointing to a very important point because think of, uh, again, we're in Paris, so let's, let's continue a little bit. Paris was a work in progress, and then it became kind of finished and fixed mm. and protected as a historical edifice. And then nothing could happen except outside in areas. Yeah. Now, when cities turn themselves into museums, when they yeah. put too many regulations, yeah. it means that you lose the dynamic development of a city. And I think that balance between private and public, mm. as the minister said, is a key balance to make a great city. Okay. So I believe the success factor of solving this is actually that we see countries, cities having great ambition, for example, to have a high penetration of ICT. I think the mm. biggest success is when they also have targets for sort of digital public transportation, targets for digital education or healthcare. When they pool them, what we have seen is then investment comes, private investments, but not only having a, it's great to have a high broadband penetration in Paris, that's not enough. You can also 
drive this with incentives by uh, the parking space, or if it's using smart metering of the power, etc. Then, if you have incentives of that, then private money comes in, and then it's the combination. That is a crucial. Let's see the next. We're going to take people quite quickly. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Duria Faruqi. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the City of Atlanta in the U.S. My ho the hometown <laughs> of my company. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, I had a question and a comment. Um, I, I think going back to some of the comments made about Paris, I think it's important to note that the greatest cities in the world today are better than anybody could have planned or imagined them. And to give a compliment back to Paris, I, I would say that, you know, if today we try to construct or replicate a city that's as successful or as incredible as Paris or New York, I'm not sure what plan we would come up with, which goes back to this tension around um, what's the appropriate balance in planning versus um, flexibility in what, terms of cities growing. What do you think the balance is? So my question is, is it not an appropriate path to focus on winning residents, keeping residents and jobs? Because if Okay, you, over what? Keeping residents and jobs over what? Versus the process that does that. Right. So, <laughs> so which, which is a, a demand-based approach around, you know, be competitive to make sure that residents well, you know, want to live in your city but and the jobs want to come there. But the residents will stay if you have a nice neighborhood, if you have a lot of green yes. space, if, if you have a job yeah. and so on. So uh, actually, let me just make a little comment here. The division between planning and architecture, which is really a carryover from the 19th century and 20th, where there was a division. There were planners doing planning, sociologists doing sociology, philosophers doing philosophy. On the other side were the technicians, the architects, mm. the implementers. That division is being really overcome in we're really working together. I think that's the key collaborative interdisciplinary approach where you don't have the division because that division created very artificial right. cities. Right. Quickly. No, the only thing just to add to that, but you, I mean, it's interesting what you say from coming from Atlanta. I mean, New York City in the last four or five years has actually decided, the mayor in particular, to invest in a whole university complex. Mm -hmm. NYU is at the heart of that and other universities to create exactly the jobs. The answer to your question is creating an environment which has resilience, which one day can be housing, another day can be a, a fashion hothouse, another day can be an office. Right. So that links very much the spatial to the economic. I'm going to keep us moving. Yes, sir, who are you and why? It's Brian Kilkelly from the Urban Land Institute. Um, question for Hans um, regarding sort of technology companies and their appetite, if you like, for long-term investment. Because currently we have all these challenges and opportunities around the world and cities to develop them better. We also have a financial crisis. So right at the moment when we are at a tipping point where we've got huge opportunities, we're also at a point where there is very little money, there's very little appetite for risk amongst the developers and the landowners, which we just talked about. And I think one of the opportunities now is that actually companies like Ericsson, Cisco, IBM, Microsoft, others have an appetite and see a long-term vision for um, making this a connected society. All right. Would they be willing to put their money uh, into long-term projects to help developers make this happen? I feel like I'm putting in long money all the time. I'm spending five and a half billion US dollars in research and development every year. That's what we're doing. And the products we're developing and the technology we're developing are things that are coming out maybe five to ten years from now in mass volumes. So, yes, long term we are certain that connectivity network society will happen. Uh, the underlying demand for everyone in this room to use technology to be more efficient at work, at life, continues. That will happen also for enterprises and finally, or not finally, but also for society, uh, education, healthcare, and all of that. And we're only in the tipping point of, the, of using the networks for that. So far, it has been you and me using our smartphone and checking the weather and everything like that. In years from now, we're going to think totally different how the networks are used, and, and in th both society and enterprise will use it very different. That's right. true. That's true because the first cars were in the form of horses. Oh. They had the what? Horse with wheels. That, that, was, that was called a horseless <laughs> carriage. That was the second technology shift that we have seen. The ICT is the fifth technology <laughs> revolution. You're absolutely right. All right, All right sir, at the back. Well, uh, I think the discussion. Who are you, sir? Uh, sorry, Thomas Sefcik, Artesia. The discussion is not bold enough, um, and I try uh -huh. to give the answer uh, to your question to the you know, uh, uh, Liverpool mayor and also the shortcomings of the uh, um, decentralization. It's about money. 
And at the end of the day... And Who's I'm money? Gonna, uh, I'm going <laughs> to come in a minute. It's basically <laughs> the ability of cities to tax, to tax, to have their own tax power. Oh. Uh, and I think, you know, when we have this global competition, this de facto you city want to states, give, You want to give cities the power to tax? Absolutely, because if we move to this global Minister? competition of cities, we need ta cities Minister, that basically have all right. ta taxes. All right, Minister, well, he wants have, to... They, they do have the power to tax, of course. They levy property taxes, and they vary considerably. But I would... Uh, a lot of the, the revenues that are raised in cities go straight to the National Treasury. So are you going to hand it back? I think it should be handed back. All right, you are going to hand it back. Um, Ricky, is, is, is money a problem in all of this? Is, is money the real problem, Ricky? Yeah. What? Uh, what? You what need money to build anything, yeah. but the, Karl Marx wasn't right, because it's not only about money. It's about culture, it's about memory, and it's about a spirit of a city. And he was wrong because he th thought money is the only driver, but I think it's people's talents people's desires and their actions, which really are at the forefront of a city. Look, Plato, two and a half thousand years ago, said we've got a problem in our little city of Athens. We've got the rich and the poor, we need social justice. So the problem is not new. All right, Rich, can, I, can I to answer yeah, that? I yes. think it's not the question of money, it's a question of value. Value? Uh, value, in the sense Value for it, money? No, 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 <laughs> no, value for money is part of it. But money for money. to look at investment in a city, not as a, a cash, rich, and what is your return on investment, say over one year. Yeah. yeah say the Olympics in London, right, which is starting in 73 days, but over the next 20, 30 years. That's real value. Can I give you an example of that, Richard? What, value for money? Yeah, we, we just that's had a deal question. with uh, Manchester, uh, in which uh, Manchester is investing from its own resources two billion pounds in transport improvements, and it will get a rebate from central government to the extent right. that its GVA is above the regional average mm -hmm. over the next 20 years. That seems the kind of deal that... Um, uh, that uh, We're going to move okay. fast to talk to get as many people in. Here, yes, ma'am. Wow. <coughs> I'm Dagmar Blumer from Bombardier Transportation, and I love this uh, discussion about transport systems because uh, that's what where I... Where are you from? I'm sorry, you're from where? Bombardier Transportation. Oh, we Bombardier, do, uh, yes, yes. Rail systems. And um, the one Very thing that really um, is key here, there's a lot of cities with transport needs, but not with the money to afford it. And um, so uh, this discussion about first the capital expenditure, uh, looking at opportunities to combine infrastructure, like how can we combine the uh, rail infrastructure with other utilities, for example, by um, having inductive charging, which can be used by rail, buses, and cars, or by putting uh, pipes into elevated systems, and on the other hand, on the operating expenditure, what? if you involve people in setting up the alignment, uh, you will get a better ridership and the system will better pay for itself. Ma'am. Barbara Thomas, Judge, Chairman of the UK Pension Protection Fund. I think you need both money and leadership. It's a confluence. New York City's had the power to tax for years, but it wasn't until we had strong mayors that we got anything done. In the UK, we're doing something very innovative, which is the pension funds are forming an infrastructure fund so that they can fund infrastructure with the backing of the government so that we can put the money in the leaders' what? hands. Ma'am. Uh, my name is Yona Strelitz from London. My question is to Greg Clark. Uh, many people are now increasingly concerned that sustainable urbanization has to look at the interface between cities and their hinterland. And their, what? You, and their hinterland. Could you comment on the, your government's uh, place for city regions in your localism agenda? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to ask him to comment to you on that privately um, <laughs> afterwards. Would you mind, Minister, sure. taking that answer? I, I don't think necessarily we want to get into the weeds. Can I, make, can I just make a brief point? I mean, I completely agree that In other cities... words, he's going to answer it anyway. <laughs> yes, go ahead, then. <laughs> Any modern concept of a city, it seems right. to me, is about what happens beyond the, the city walls. And, and most mayors of my experience take as much of an interest uh, in what happens beyond their authority as within it. And that is uh, a sign of leadership. All right. Well, microphone to the gentleman up the back with his hand uh, up, and, and the lady yeah. in the green. Esther Dyson from New York. Very briefly, just in the discussion of tax and money, include taxing of what? So congestion charging is a great way to re introduce the external costs of people driving. And so what you want to do is use your tax power to reflect the costs people impose on the system and then use it to pay for things like transit 
that are very cost effective. Isn't the problem with taxing, and I'll take it to, to, to the panel as well, but to you, ma'am, from New York, isn't the problem with taxing whether the electorate trust the authority who's that's taxing them? Incentives. Sorry, that's why you need leadership, but leadership is always ex post facto. You usually end up with the taxing before you get the leadership. <laughs> well, you have to, I think, again, you know, the, uh, I think it was Aristotle who thought that a city should not be bigger than the mayor would know every single citizen. The mayor <laughs> would know every single citizen, and that's democracy. But we have huge cities. So it is a question of how to empower people to participate in decision making, really, uh, of practical things, such as taxation, such as development, such as planning. I think that's going to come with new technology as well. Yes. The Californian model of the proposition, I think, is a very interesting yeah. one, and that's worked quite well. Do you like it or not? I think it's, it's a very interesting model. No, that's not what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. there's lots of things that are very interesting. Do you like it or not? I do. You do? Excellent. Right, gentlemen at the back. Do you well, like it? All right, the results have been terrible. That's democracy. Welcome on board. Um, <laughs> lady at the back. You must have voted against them. <laughs> lady, uh, sorry, sorry, gentlemen at the back. I do beg your pardon. My name is uh, Walter Mukwen. I'm from South Africa, African oh, Rainbow person. Investments. There's a big problem in South Africa at the moment in Johannesburg, especially with the introduction of the e-tolling. Uh, it's actually going to court now because um, the citizens of the city are not prepared to pay. Right. You know, so the question is, who should be paying for this? Is it government because it is a public-private partnership that's been established and there's big money already committed, but uh, there's rolling protests now because right. the citizens Right, well, we'll have to take that because that's, that's the minutiae of the um, Johannesburg situation, which uh, I'm not familiar with. Um, and unless the panel wish to jump on board, uh, we'll take that one privately with you afterwards. The gentleman halfway down who's been patiently with his hand up, can you... Just shout, sir, please. <laughs> we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, you're the one, the one with the Apple computer. Oh, yes, we want to hear from you. I think the problem... Where are you from? China. Excellent. Horizon Consulting. So I think a uh, problem we are discussing here is all we're discussing is, par is Paradigm City, which most obvious uh, appeared in Walt Benjamin Arcade Project. But what we're facing now is some old cities, let's say Lhasa in Tibet. And then I'm now asking this question. Would it be possible through knowledge convergence develop Tibet or Lhasa into a sanctuary of fauna and flora, an international meditation zone, a spiritual, spatial, administrative zone, a research nexus of pre-modern world and alternative knowledge a cornucopia of highland civilization. Right. A venue for cognition in wilderness. But I've never mentioned the word city because I think what we need to build is anthropolis. Right. I, I think the whole question of Lhasa and Tibet may have other problems that we need to, uh, <laughs> that frankly, sir, I'd like you to just think about before we go on to whether or not it's a center for uh, meditation and, and other things. The gentleman over here. With, one of the questions that you raised earlier dealt with public-private partnerships. And I'm very, very interested in ultimately, does government now create a market in its absence to take leadership, have the resources to do what it needs to do in their own communities, in their own backyards? All right, you're nodding, Hans. That's going straight to you. I think there's a difference. I mean, it's, of course, not all of it. But we see, of course, good example. I mean, I, of course, take one close to, our, to ourselves, the, the Swedish Royal Seaport or the Stockholm Royal Seaport, which is a, it's sort of building a, an environment for 10,000 new inhabitants in Stockholm that's going to use all the latest technologies, not only ICT, it's a lot of other stuff as well, in order to have a sustainable piece of Stockholm. And there's a public-private partnership. I mean, right. uh, we are part of it, of course, the, uh, the, the city of Stockholm and a lot of other companies, because we believe so much in that can be a role model that you can duplicate later right. on. And I think pilots need to be started and show, because you're going to do errors, you're going to try it, and you're going to improve. And I think that's what we need to do. Finally, we are just about out of time. We've gone over, but we started late, so we finished late. Um, I want to take your final thoughts. Um, before that, let's just take a vote in here as to where the people in the room feel the leadership or the primary responsibility rests. 
is it with industry? Hands up if you think industry does have the primary leadership role because they, after all, have the money and the investment. There's two people there. Yeah, I, will, I will talk with them later on. That's my question. Do they work for you? No, Is they it don't weak? work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and they were not voting us so. <laughs> Is it with design, architecture, planning? Oh. Yeah, wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> Shouting doesn't increase your vote. Is it with... Government. Ooh, wow. You had two. <laughs> so I ask each of you finally whether or not you agree with our distinguished guests. What are you now going to do to play your role in the future in this? We'll start with you, Hans. Ooh. Uh, short, uh, we will continue to advocate for that broadband and ICT has a huge positive impact on cities. We will talk to governments, we will be part of these type of projects. Minister. I think it's paradoxical for a minister of a national government, but actually it's to take power away from people like me and put it into local leaders. And this time next year, wherever we may be, oh please Liverpool, <laughs> let them. <laughs> See if you're still saying that in two years time. <laughs> I'm going to have, let you have the last word, but uh, to invest in high quality, accessible, affordable inner city schools. And what for you, Daniel, is the key that you... I think to... the key is to make beautiful and interesting cities that really are spectacular and not boring. Can we do it? Of course we can. Can we? Of course. You're sure? I, I'm sure. Ladies and no, gentlemen, no. our panel, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.